जयो राधमा जय कुंज बिहारे जयो राधमा जय कुंज बिहारे जय गोपीजन वल्लभ जय नंदन भ्रजा जन रंजन शोदनंदन भ्रजा जन रंजन मुना तेरावन चा रे जयो राधा माधवा जयो कुंज बिहारे नंदन भज जन रंजन शोदनंदन भज जन रंजन शोदनंदन भज जन रंजन शोदनंदन भज जन रंजन मुना तेरा वन चा रे मुना तेरा वन चे जयो कुंज बिहारे कुंज बिहारे श्रीराध माधवा की जा श्री प्रभुपाद की जा Feels like we are on a soccer field <laughs> since this is open, <laughs> and two curtains are mixing up. I hope they close sometimes these walls. This morning we are reading from Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto Three, Chapter Five. Vidura talks with Maitreya, Shloka Nine. ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ये ना प्रजना मुक्त आत्मा कर्मा 
रूपाधानम च विधा यधा था नारायण विश्वश्री आत्मयो नेताचानो वर्णाया विप्रवार्या ये न प्रजानुता आत्मकर्मा रूपाधानम च विधा यधा था नारायण विश्वश्री आत्मयो नेताचनु वर्णाय विप्रवार्या ये ना बाय विच प्रजानम ऑफ डोज हु आर बोर्न उठा एस आल्सो आत्मकर्मा डेस्टिन इंगेजमेंट रूप फॉर्म एंड फीचर अभिदानम endeavors cha also vidham 
differentiation, Vyadhatha, dispersed, Narayana, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishwasrik, the creator of the universe, Atmayoni, self-sufficient, Etat, all these, Cha, also, Na, unto us, Varnaya, describe, Vipravarya, or chief amongst the Brahmanas. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. O chief amongst the Brahmanas, please also describe how Narayan, the creator of the universe and the self-sufficient Lord, has differently created the natures, activities, forms, and features, and names of different living entities. Purport. Every living being is under the plan of his natural inclinations. In terms of the modes of material nature, his work is manifested in terms of the nature of the three modes. His form and bodily features are designed according to his work, and his name is designated according to his bodily features. For example, the higher classes of men are white, Shukla, and the lower classes of men are black. This division of white and black is in terms of one's white and black duties of life. Pious acts lead one to take birth in a good and highly placed family, to become rich, to become a learned, and to acquire beautifully bodily features. Impious acts lead one to become poor by parentage, to be always in want, to become a fool or illiterate, and to acquire ugly bodily features. Vidura requested Maitreya to explain these differences between all living creatures made by Narayan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Om Jnanati Mirandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shrimate Bhaktivedanta Swamini Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Ghoravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine E Krishna Karuna Sindho Dinabandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gorangir Hade Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Namo Mahavadanyaya Krishna Prema Pradayate Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Namne Gaurat Vishena Maha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadhadar Shivasadi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So Vidura requested Maitreya here to explain these differences between the living creatures made by the Lord. So if you look at the Lord's creation, there is a vast variety of bodily forms in the land, in the water, in the sky. It says 8,400,000 forms are present there. And they are all living in a variety of living circumstances. And this variety is manifested in the terms of the modes of material nature. And if we just look within human society, there are also vast differences of living circumstances and vast differences of forms, bodies of humans. So we have different nations, different races, colors, black, white, yellow, some are very rich, some are very poor, some are educated, some are not educated. It's interesting here that Srila Prabhupada uh, mentions, gives example that higher classes are white, 
and the lower classes are black. Uh, this is not absolute rule. Uh, it's just an example which sometimes applies and sometimes may not apply. Otherwise, all people living in the West, they will be higher class, but obviously <laughs> they are not. Uh, just because their skin is fair, because there is a less sun, sun there, doesn't mean that they are in a sattva guna. Uh, uh, similarly, in, inside of India, just the people in the North India, they have a, you know, the, the lighter skin complexion, doesn't mean that they are higher than the South Indians. Uh, but perhaps within one locality and one ethnic group, this could be more applicable within the context of the Varnashrama society. So lower classes in the Varnashrama society, they perform lower types of work, uh, like cleaning or working in the fields. So they are more exposed to the sun, and naturally their skin color becomes more, more dark. Uh, and higher classes, they, they don't need uh, such, they don't perform such work and they are not so exposed to the elements and naturally their skin complexion becomes uh, lighter. Anyway, this was just uh, one example and certainly Shla Prabhupada, he was not a racist to mention <laughs> that uh, those who are lower class, they are black. Uh, it's it's, it's a just an uh, example. But idea here uh, is that internal states of mind and the modes of nature that uh, prevail the mind and consciousness, uh, they became manifested externally, that you can notice it on external bodily features, that you can recognize it. Uh, so this is the point, that what is inside comes out outside, and then you can recognize it according to certain uh, description. For example, if somebody looks very kind of stern and strict and tense, looking very intense and rough with the tightly pressed lips, you could, to a certain degree, you know, infer that uh, he gets angry very often, that uh, somehow his emotional states are leaning towards the anger and, uh, and uh, violence. Uh, and it just becomes manifested as, as the bodily feature on, on his face. Uh, physiognomy is the science that studies the states of mind that are uh, visible on the face. On the just basis of the, of the bodily features, of the facial characteristics, you can uh, recognize the character of people. For example, when Sukadeva Goswami, when he entered the assembly of the sages, uh, to speak to Maharaj Parikshit, uh, the sages there, Pra Prabhupada mentions they were experts in physiognomy, they immediately could recognize that this is a very, very exalted soul. Uh, his face was lotus-like, uh, and all his bodily features resemble Krishna's bodily features. And uh, even his skin complexion, they resemble Krishna's complexion. It was like a shyam, you know, like a, a rain cloud. Uh, so that means that he was so much absorbed in Krishna that his bodily features assumed Krishna's bodily features. Uh, so this is the, the lesson that we can derive here. So whatever and on whomever we meditate upon intensely, his characteristics we gradually assume. Uh, I remember long, long time ago, maybe 20, 25 years back, when I still had a job and I was sitting in some office, in some bank office. I had not much work uh, on some days, so I was just reading Prabhupada's books and sometimes Prabhupada's biographies. So that particular day I was reading, uh, I remember still, my glorious master of Burijan Prabhu. And he wrote it so nicely, and I was completely, you know, absorbed in Prabhupada Lila, and I was completely oblivious of everything around me, and some colleagues were just coming in and out from the office. At one moment, a uh, few of them, they gather in front of the, my desk, and then they were looking at me and talking, and one of them was saying, look at him, today he looks so special, 
so ready and some effort is coming. What is this? Did you use some special cream, some beauty product? Can you tell us a secret? <laughs> they were asking me. I, of course, I loved them off. I just dismissed them. But then I realized that actually just because I was thinking so deeply about Prabhupada, it became visible to outside people. Because Prabhupada is such a pure soul that even, you know, meditation on him, you know, gives you some, <laughs> some, some radiance because he's, a, he's all radiant. So that's why we want to meditate on Krishna and his devotees who are, who, who are pure, who are above the modes of material nature. Because in this way, we also acquire their characteristics and their qualities. But let us go back to these differences that come from different individual karmas and karma falas, the, the results of uh, actions, actions and fruits. So what makes a living being act in a certain ways and, that, and thus shape their own destinies? There are two, two very important concepts uh, that I want to mention here. One is called samskara, another is called vasana. So what is samskara? Sanskara refers to mental impressions, imprints left on the mind by previous past experiences, actions, and thoughts. So everything we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, or do, it leaves some impression, some sanskara on the mind. And obviously, these impressions, they can be positive, they can be negative, or neutral. And uh, they all influence our perceptions, our behavior, our habits. In terms of strength, how deeply they became impressed, embedded in the mind, they can be strong or weak to various degrees and shades. And it will all depend on, uh, on the intensity of the experience. If something is very casual, you know, in perception, it might not be very strong sanskara, but if something is, uh, something is very, you know, for example, traumatic, uh, accompanied by strong, strong emotions and feelings, it, it can leave very strong sanskara that can last your whole life. Uh, that's why traumas are so, uh, difficult to heal. Or it could be good experience. For example, who remembers their first prasadam? And first time you tasted prasadam. For some people, it's something really special <laughs> that you never experience later, although you ate prasadam many times, but you got so used so much. But first time, it's something special. Or first time you heard the holy name. It's also, it leaves... You know, these sort of experiences can leave very, very deep sanskaras. So these sanskaras, they accumulate over the course of one's present life and also over the course of many lifetimes. And they all deeply influence thoughts, desires, reactions. And they often operate on a subconscious level that we are not even aware of. And then there is a second concept called vasana. Vasana refers to latent tendencies or inclinations that are stored in the citta or in subconscious minds. And they arise from sanskaras. So these are basically deeply seated desires, cravings, fears, attachments, aversions, and they all drive our behavior. They are often described as, as the seeds from which desires and actions sprout. Uh, and sometimes they equate it to desires. So they shape our motivations, our preferences, actions. And unlike sanskaras, uh, the sanskaras impressions themselves, the vasanas, they are underlying tendencies and predispositions that emerge from, from the sanskaras. So basically, sanskara is the cause of the vasana, of the inclinations and tendencies. And uh, both sanskaras and vasanas, they very much influence our present life. Uh, for example, if we had some trauma, 
as I already mentioned, it, it, it can very much influence our present day behavior. For example, I, I know a devotee who ha has a fear from water. Whenever he's close to the river or lake, he feels some resistance and uh, some, he feels very uneasy and he, he, he's afraid to go inside. And for a long time he didn't know uh, what is the cause of this. But at one point he did some you know, therapy and past life regression and then he actually discovered that in, in a previous life he, he, he drowned. And then it was a, such, such a traumatic experience that, uh, that uh, left uh, the deep some scar and deep vassal in his mind that now he, he's afraid of water. So in this way, these impressions and desires and inclinations and tendencies, they're carried over many lifetimes. So transcending karma requires, requires transcending these samskaras and vasanas, and that's done by the spiritual practice and all processes like yoga, like jnana, and uh, of course bhakti. Uh, they are they're aiming uh, to overcome these deeply rooted samskaras and vasanas. Of course, this is much easier to say than to do. Otherwise, everybody would be liberated uh, easily overnight. So let us go a little bit more into the samskaras. Uh, there are two types of uh, samskaras and vasanas, inauspicious and auspicious ones. Uh, Let's take one example. Let's take uh, the story from Bhagavatam, a Jamil story. Example of inauspicious samskara. When he was, he was a very cultured you know, young Brahmana from the higher class. Uh, he was worshiping Lord Narayan, but uh, in the forest he happened to see a low-born man embracing a low-born woman prostitute. And that lusty sight somehow awakened in him uh, samskara that he had from previous life and vasana from the previous life. And he just could not resist. It reinforced his old samskara. And once he acted upon it, meaning when he went after that prostitute and enjoyed with him, he reinforced, he reinforced it so much that uh, he became complete slave. And the rest of the, his life he spent enjoying with, with, that, uh, with that prostitute. That was the power of that old samskara and vasana that he carried from previous life that almost destroyed uh, his present life. Luckily, he had also a good samskara in the present life, meaning that uh, before this happened, uh, he was nicely educated by his father, so he worshipped the deity of Lord Narayan, and he was chanting Lord Narayan's names. So this also left some impression, some saskara, which was not that strong as the, as the previous one, but still it left impression on his mind. So that's why he named his son, uh, according to this uh, habit that, uh, of chanting the Lord's name, so he named him Narayan, and that saved him at the end of life. So in this way, he was saved by his good samskara, by his good vasana. So beside samskaras or impressions, uh, which may be accidental or may not be accidental, there will be also deeper cause behind our tendencies, our inclinations, our desires. Let's take another person from Bhagavatam somebody of demoniac mentality, for example, Hrinyakashipu. What were his inclinations? Srila Prabhupada mentions inclinations in this period. That's why I'm focusing now on inclinations or vasanas. Of course, Hrinyakashipu's inclinations, they were demoniac, inauspicious. He had a deep-seated hatred of the Supreme Lord and the devotees. He had a hatred of everything godly, hatred of Brahmanas and Brahmanical culture. So what was the cause? We, we don't find any samskara that was the cause of this. But if you look at the history of the fall of gatekeepers in Vaikuntha, Jain, Vijay, we find that the cause 
of Hinakashipu's bed vasanas was anger of four Kumaras. Somehow he angered four Kumaras and they cursed him. And due to their curse, he attained these bad, bad demoniac inclinations and vasanas, he became a demon. And then, on contrary, let's look at his son, Prahlad, his inclinations, his vasanas, his tendencies were completely opposite. They were godly, they were, uh, they were inclinations to chant, hear, and glorify the Supreme Lord. And what was the quote of Prahlad's inclinations? If you remember, when Prahlad was in a womb, his mother was under the care of Narada Muni, and Narada Muni instructed her, he spoke Bhagavatam, he spoke for quite some time instructing the, the child in the womb together with the mother. And thus, the cause of Prahlad's inclinations was the mercy of a saintly person, mercy of Narada Muni. So in this way, we have anger or curse as the cause of bad inclinations and then mercy of devotee on the other side as the cause of good inclinations. Let's look at another example of a person with the bad inclinations again. In Chaitanya Chaitamrita, it's described that uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had one uh, god uncle, meaning the god brother of his spiritual master called Ramachandra Puri. So at one point he came to Puri to visit Paramananda Puri, his god brother and disciple of Madhavendra Puri. So they were both disciples of Madhavendra Puri. So when he came, Paramananda Puri, he offer respects at the feet of Ramachandra Puri because Ramachandra Puri he was a senior and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also happened to be there. So he also offered obeisances. So Ramachandra Puri embraced both of them and uh, Sri Prabhupada comments, uh, because Ramachandra Puri was a disciple of Madhavendra Puri, both Paramananda Puri and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu offered him respectful obeisances. Shla Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur comments that although Ramachandra Puri was naturally very envious, so naturally he was very envious, and although he was against the principles of Vaishnavism, or in other words, against the principles of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his devotees, common people nevertheless addressed him as Goswami or Gosani, because he was superficially in the renounced order and dressed like a sannyasi. So he was dressed like a sannyasi, but he was very envious and, demon and had the demoniac characteristics, demoniac nature, that, uh, that were against the, the Supreme Lord and his devotees. So these were his predispositions, his inclinations and his tendencies. Krishna does cover and Saraswati Thakur, they explained at the very beginning of these pastimes. So when he came there, three of them, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Paranda Puri, and Ramachandra Puri, they talked for some time about Krishna. And at that moment, at one point, Jagananda Pandit, he came there and extended invitation for lunch to Ramachandra Puri. Ramachandra Puri accepted the invitation. He went for lunch. Jagananda ordered huge quantities of Lord Jagannath's Mahaprasadam and uh, he served Ramachandra Puri to his full satisfaction. When he finished eating, Ramachandra Puri, he told Jagananda, now you please take prasad, I will serve you. So he washed his hands and he seated Jagananda and started serving him. And he served him more and more and again and again, although Jagananda was already full, still Ramachandra Puri, he insisted, no, you must eat more, you must eat more. So in this way, he fell him till his neck. And when it was finished, Ramachandra Puri proudly exclaimed in front of Jagadananda, I have heard 
that the associate of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu cannot control their tongues and they eat too much. Now I have personally witnessed this. See, he induced him to eat too much, and now he <laughs> used this to criticize him. I knew it. I was right. <laughs> Jagannath, of course, was perplexed. Anyway, he left and told the incident to Lord Chaitanya and other devotees. So the characteristic or nature of Swabhava of Ramachandra Puri was that he would first induce somebody to eat more than necessary and then he would criticize. So one can ask, how did he acquire this tendency, this inclination to criticize people, even to the point that he would, uh, you know, induce them to do wrong and then criticize them? How did he acquire this tendency? How it was that it was present in, in his uh, character? The answer is that it was offense to his spiritual master, Madhavendra Puri. When the Madhavendra Puri was at the end of his life, uh, Ramachandra Puri came there to visit him. And uh, being uh, suffering separation from Krishna, Madhavendra Puri, he would you know, cry out, Oh my Lord Krishna, I could not reach you, nor, nor I could reach you about Mathura. I'm dying in unhappiness. And uh, Ramachandra Puri, he was listening to this, he was thinking, why is my guru lamenting? He's supposed to be you know, firmly fixed in Brahman, and Brahman is, you know, Ananda. He should be blissful. So he told him, why are you lamenting unnecessarily? Fix your mind on Brahman. <laughs> and when Madhavendra Puri heard this, he became very, very angry. Oh, you rascal, you came here to give me pain. Don't show your face here to me. Just go anywhere you like. Get lost from here. I don't want to see you anymore. Otherwise, if I see you, I shall not attain, attain my destination. So Krishna Das Kaviraj, he comments, A.J. Srimadavendra Sripad Upeka Korila Se apparade in har vasana janmila. Again, I have this word vasana. So Ramachandra Puri was denounced by Madhavendra Puri. And due to this apparat, what was created? Vasana was created. Inclination, tendency, and material desire appear within him. So it's not that he had it uh, from time immemorial. No, he, he was a normal person, but because of this grave offense to his guru, he attained this vasana, this inclination to criticize others. And Srila Prabhupada comments actually on this word. The word vasana, he translated as material desire, refers in this particular case to dry speculative knowledge. Meaning that uh, dry speculation is a type of a material desires. Uh, so due to curse of his spiritual master, due to unsatisfaction of his spiritual master, he attained inclination to speculate like a, like a mayavadi and inclination to criticize others. A. A. J. Srimadavendra Sripad Upeka Kuril. I already read it, yeah. See, yeah, yeah. So one who is attached, the, the translation, one who is attached to dry speculative knowledge has no relationship with Krishna. His occupation is criticizing Vaishnavas. Thus, he is situated in criticism. So Ramachandra Bodhi, he became firmly situated in criticism. It, be, it became a part of his nature. Uh, and Srila Bhaktisattva Sarasitakur, he comments on his uh, Anubhashya that Ramachandra Puri had a steady desire to criticize others. It's not that sometimes he felt, oh, let me criticize. No, it was, a, it was such a strong desire. Day after day he had this desire and he had to find victims to fulfill his desire. He to, had to find somebody to fulfill his desire. It was a very strong desire. And then we have a, another example, god brother of Ramachandra Puri called Ishwarapuri. 
who became the spiritual master of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, contrary to Ramachandra Puri, he performed the service to, Man, to, Man, to Madhavendra Puri, even such a menial, menial services at the last stage of his life, like cleaning his stool and urine with his own hand. And also he chanted about the Lord Krishna's pastimes. In this way, he helped Madhavendra Puri remember Krishna. And thus he became greatly, greatly pleased with him. And he gave him benedictions uh, that uh, Ishwara Puri, he became ocean of love of God. And he was blessed so much that even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you know, took initiation from him and accepted him as his spiritual master. So this is the example of great personalities, uh, benediction and punishment. Uh, and they both caused different uh, vasanas, different inclinations. One inclination was for pure love for Krishna. Another inclination is for dry speculation and criticism. So Ramachandra Puri, when he was staying in, a, in the Jagannath Puri, after this incident with Jagannanda, he wanted to find fault with the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. So he was gathering intelligence. He was gathering different sort of informations what was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu doing? Where he was eating, sleeping? What were his regulatory principles? What was his lunch? And everything. Just he wanted to know to find some fault. Although he struggled very, very hard. He could not really find anything because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was such exemplary, exemplary sannyasi. And he followed very strictly all the rules and regulations of sannyasi ashram. But when he could not find, he imagined. He just, uh, you know created the fall himself. And he said he must be eating sweets at night when nobody sees it. And how can a person in renounced order can eat so many sweets? And then in this way he, he blasphemed Lord Chaitanya to, to different uh, personalities in Puri, to associate with Lord Chaitanya. And the rumors about his blasphemy even came to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu but he remained unaffected. So at one point, Ramachandra Puri, although he was criticizing him be behind his back, he would regularly come to visit Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, every time he would offer his obeisance and touch Ramachandra Puri's feet, and uh, Ramachandra Puri would bless him, bless the Lord. <laughs> and at one point, uh, when he came to visit him, he noticed that there were some ants crawling here and there in the room of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Gambira. So he said, wow, I, have he I heard from others that uh, you are eating sweets during the night and now I found the evidence myself. These ants must be here because you ate the sweets during the night and now they are eating the remnants. And in this way, he criticized the Lord directly in front of himself. <laughs> and then he left. And of course, the Lord accepted this uh, unwarranted chastisement very humbly because it was his god uncle, the godmother of his spiritual master. So he didn't want to protest. And he immediately told Govinda, from now on, I will accept only half of what I was normally eating. So whoever invites me for lunch, I will accept only the bare, bare minimum. So he decreased his eating to half. And Govinda also, he could not, of course, eat normally when the Lord was eating half of his normal meal. So he also decreased. And Lord Chaitanya's associates, they also became very disturbed and they also decreased their eating. In, in this way, everybody was very, very much unhappy with Ramachandra Puri and his criticism. And it lasted for some time, and then at one point, Ramachandra Puri, he, he left Jagannath Puri to visit some other holy places, and then the Lord resumed his normal eating habits, and everybody was very, very, very much relieved. And it's interesting that in, a, in a Bhagavatam, there is a one instruction in 11th canto where Lord Krishna instructs Uddhava that one should 
not either praise nor criticize the characteristic of activities of others. But it's explained that uh, this in injunction for non-praising is a lower type. Uh, one can sometimes neglect it and praise others, but injunction for not criticizing is stronger and should be always obeyed. But Ramachandra Puri, he behaved exactly the opposite. He would never praise anybody and he would always criticize. So he turned everything upside down. And the result was seen, he became a dry, Mayavadi dry speculator who lost the mercy of the Lord and his devotees. And on the other side, Ishwara Puri, he became a spiritual master of the Supreme Lord himself. So these are the sum of the examples of bad samskaras and vasanas that are caused by anger of uh, the Lord and his devotees uh, and auspicious ones that are caused by satisfaction of the Lord and his devotees. So in this way we can learn from them that uh, we should strictly, strictly try not to criticize because uh, it's also mentioned in the Shastra that uh, by criticizing others we acquire their bad qualities. And in this way we acquire material desires and then we cause the our fall down. And on the contrary, if we praise others for their good qualities, we may acquire these good qualities. So we want to attain good samskaras, good vasanas, not bad ones. And these are some lessons that we can learn. Sometimes some devotees think it's their mission to correct everybody and anybody criticizing for everything and anything, but they don't realize that uh, in this way they might acquire bad, bad inclinations, bad tendencies, which will be very dangerous for their spiritual life. Of course, those who are in a position of authority, like a guru or spiritual master, they might need sometimes to correct. Uh, but if it's not our service, our job, we should refrain from criticizing others. Let them do whatever they want to do. Let Krishna and those who are in power for that judge them. Why should I judge them? Anyway, this was just some thoughts about the importance of uh, some scars and vatsanas or inclinations because in the purport Prabhupada mentioned these inclinations uh, that are natural inclinations that all living beings have under different modes of material nature. If you have any comments or questions, yes, Gandhari Mataji, and then after that, Prabhu. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned about it's, uh, the physical features, which we also learned in the previous chapter that Lord Krishna uh, went to learn in Gurukul, and that was one of the arts that was discussed. So, I just want to share this for the benefit of preachers because I've been doing this because in basic Ayurveda, you can actually learn this that simply by looking at a person's features, you can tell their body types, you know, dosas, right? So it becomes so much fun at um, trade shows, right? Uh, you can sell your books through these different techniques. I used to use palmistry, just basic palmistry, and saying you are predicted in the Bhagavad Gita. And then the basic palmistry will prove that they are actually very pious. Not only that, but they are almost devotees, because in order for them to come in contact with devotee, means they have already gathered a lot of Agyata Sukriti, especially in the trade shows where there is chanting, prashad. So the point is, I just thought I'd share this regarding physical features and, you know, palmistry and other techniques. And I used to sell Bhagavad Gita like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it could be useful, but it can be also dangerous because... Uh, 
if we know some physiognomy or palmistry or astrology or whatever, we might be inclined to judge and they say, oh, I think he has this bad quality. And then we start criticizing. <laughs> so it should be used very, very carefully, not for criticism. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu, for the wonderful class, uh, particularly regarding karma, then samskara and vasana. Mm. Now, my question is, when full annihilation takes place, that means everything is gone, no material, it's like material cloud. All the material elements are in unmanifested form. You said vasana is in chitta, you said uh, um, samskara is in the mind and karma, where are they residing? We living entities are still there, but where are these three things residing? Karma, samskara and vasana, when we are, um, when there is full annihilation taking place. At the time of fuel annihilation, all living entities, they merge back in Mahavishnu. Uh, and uh, they are in sleeping condition there till the next creation cycle. But their desires, their sanskaras, their vasanas, they remain within them. So when the next cycle of creation starts, again, the whole creation is manifested because all these living entities, they have different, uh, different desires and they want to enjoy the material nature. So it's, it's within the soul. The, the, the desire also can be within the soul. It remains there. Uh, so, on external surface, it looks like it's just in the mind, but it, 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 it could go much, much, much deeper, you know. Thank you, they have desire for enjoyment of the material world, and since these inclinations and tendencies are there, the Lord is so kind to, to manifest the whole creation, to create the whole world, and give them opportunity to enjoy. And then they act in accordance with their tendencies, with their inclinations, and their conditioning they had acquired in the previous creation. Is there anything else? Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. I would like to uh, comment on the uh, palmistry part. Just uh, 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 92, Mahamandra Prabhu, the great book distributor, came to this call. Can, can you speak a little loudly? Yeah. 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 I would like to uh, uh, give a small comment on the palmistry answer. Mm. Uh, 1992, uh, Mahamandra Das Prabhu, who is a book distributor in this call for a long time. So I came to Iskon Trivandrum Temple, Trivandrum Temple. I was there, we were the Brahmacharis. So then uh, he told me one incident, how we can distribute more books. That is, he told that when he was going for book distribution, he was taking only small books. So then one of the sannyasi came to uh, visit his temple. He saw uh, his bag only small books. Then he asked the Mahamandra Prabhu, are you not taking any big books? Uh, Prabhu, Amahara is very difficult. Nobody is buying. Only small books only they buy. Big books they don't buy. No, you pray to Prabhupada. Then you go and distribute books. Okay. Then based on this instruction, he gone back to the Godown again. He took one, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya, which is a big book. And then gone to Prabhupada uh, Murti and he kept there and uh, offered prayers to Prabhupada. I am taking this book, Prabhupada. By your mercy, may I be able to sell this book. Then... Uh, he gone to the book table where he used to put the book table every day and he knows that he will not able to sell this he kept it under the table and uh, after uh, like uh, the old day was there the end of the pro old book distribution uh, uh, he was going to wind up so one madaji came and she was looking under the table oh you don't have any big books yes i have so immediately took from the down of the table and he showed it to the madaji and she took it so from that, he understood that by praying to Srila Prabhupada, I able to distribute more books. So this is like uh, Mahamantra Prabhu personally told me this in 1992 in Trivandra. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Just, yes Prabhu. I have a question. Please. After you said, 
No, you, 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 you please go okay. on. Bro, uh, you said about vasanas, samskaras, you know, and you gave the example of Ajamil, how he came in contact with some bad samskaras. So, in this day and age, wherever we go, these samskaras are present. So, like our fall down, it seems like it's imminent. So, what is the hope that we can rise above these samskaras and... Yeah, the present day and age, uh, the bad samskaras you can acquire anywhere just by, you know, swipe on a mobile phone or a click on a laptop uh, and uh, it can damage, that can damage you. So, one has to be very, very careful how much he's exposing his mind to the bad influences. But of course, the samskaras also exist, with bad samskaras exist within us. Uh, and uh, these external influences, they're just triggers of these bad samskaras that we already acquired. So what is the hope? Uh, hope against hope is that we have uh, bhakti, the process of devotional service, and we have holy name of the Lord, and they have absolute power to eradicate all bad sanskaras, bad vasanas, and material desires. If we perform devotional service without aparada, without offense. Otherwise, offenses are the cause of more bad samskaras, of more bad inclinations and bad vasanas, like uh, we, hear, we heard in the example of Ramachandra Puri. So, Material desires in themselves are not that big of a problem. Bigger problem is Aparada, is, is especially Nama Aparada and Vaishnava Aparada, because they will create deeply rooted uh, material desires within our heart if we are not careful. So we should be strictly careful to avoid the Aparada and perform devotional service as sincerely as possible. And then there is every hope that old Sanskaras, old vasanas, and all bad material desires, they will, they will be eradicated. Okay, I think we'll stop here. Mataj, you had something? Yes, please. Mm, thank you very much for your you. lecture. Um, so, actually, it's so bad to criticize other people, and I see this tendency in myself um, very often. Although I really like people, and I really want to um, yeah, help them, it happens so often that I like criticize. Not to make them bad only, but also I like to help them but then I see myself criticizing. So how can I understand that it is really not good for anyone to act in this way? Because sometimes I, I think like when people say what I'm doing wrong, I can change myself. So I have to <laughs> tell people also. But this tendency is wrong, so how say, can you, you correct you, yourself? Yeah, I understand you. What you say, sometimes it could be helpful uh, for somebody to change if we not criticize but correct them uh, but it has to be done in, in the right manner uh, with the well-wishing intention with, with, the, with the real concern for the person with, with, the, with the love for the person and then they'll, when they feel that you're their real friend that you're really wishing them well they might accept otherwise if I just come and slam and they don't even know me and they don't know what I what I'm all about, they'll just get offended and nothing will happen. They will not change. Uh, they will just turn away. So nothing will be achieved. It's interesting to know that Uttama Dikhari, he, he is completely devoid of any desire to criticize others. This is one of the characteristics of Uttama Dikhari, pure soul. On, on that level, he sees no faults whatsoever. Although everybody is full of faults, material, in the material world, everybody is so conditioned, but he doesn't see. He just sees that they are servants of Krishna, parts and parcels of Krishna, and he sees all, all good in them. And only for the purpose of preaching, he comes down on a, on, on a Madhyama platform, and then he recognizes, oh, he has uh, this fault or that fault, and, but he's not seeing it as, as, as a fault. He, he, he sees it as uh, space for improvement. 
when we see something in others uh, that we should look at it, oh, here is some space that, that he could improve. And we, we should want him to improve. We want him to improve. Generally, when we criticize, we feel good because then we are putting others down and we feel superior. Oh, he has this fault and I don't have it. But actually, quite often, we are, we are projecting our own, uh, own bad qualities on others. That's why I see in you bad quality, because I have it. And then when I point it to you, I feel good because, you know, I feel like superior. I feel like your guru, uh, your spiritual master, and I'm here to tell you, oh, y you done bad thing, and, and I recognize it. No, no. But of course, there is some need for, for, for help, uh, but it should be done really with, with, with utmost care, with utmost uh, attention in a proper way. Otherwise, nothing will be achieved. Uh, only the person will get uh, angry and turn away from us. Uh, it has to be done with the, with the well-wishing. Uh, so first, before we point the mistake in others, we should examine what is, our, what is my motivation. And then if we really notice that our motivation is, is, is good, that we want him everything, they want everything well for that person, then I sh we should ask myself, so what is the way I can help him? If I tell him straight in the face, oh, you're bad, you're this or that, is it going to help? It might not help. Uh, so maybe we can try some other way. Maybe we can try to, you know, to show by our own example, how it should be done if he did something wrong. Uh, or you know, try to encourage him in some another way. Generally, just pointing mistakes, people don't like it. Uh, nobody likes it. <laughs> One really has to be very, very tolerant to accept corrections. Uh, yes, today, Mother, you wanted to say something? Thank you, Prabhu, for such a thoughtful, thought-provoking class regarding this uh, Mataji's question. Um, His Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada says that the spiritual master has the thankless task of criticizing his disciples. Mm. Why do you want to take on this seva? So, mm. it's actually a, a very introspective question. Why should we take on this seva? When we are full of faults ourselves, it is better for us to take the humble position and see, I have to learn something from this experience or this encounter. And as Bhakti Tita Maharaj says, view conflicts as your own fault first. So what is Krishna trying to teach me when I'm trying to correct others? What is it that I need to actually learn myself? Just wanted to share that. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. All glories to Shri Prabhupada, Shri Mabhagavatam Kijanitai Go Premanande Hari Hari Bhagavatam.